So let's start. Axel, you told me, probably a couple years ago now, that you know, maybe we should be putting our foot on the pedal a little harder up front, even in med, you know, asymptomatic metastatic colon cancer. So more intensive chemotherapy up front and then back off, and that, that's our frontline choice and all of that. Our, uh, and I actually listened to you, believe it or not, and oh my I've, God. <laughs> I've tended to do that more and more now that we've got maintenance therapy, things like that. Um, the Fulfirinox data is that, you know, should we be heavy-handed up front and back off and get that response early? Or should we, as you alluded to a little bit earlier today, you know, if they're asymptomatic and disease is quiet, maybe just a little Cape Cytobine and a little Bev or something yeah. like that. So I think, you know, all these different studies give us tools to adjust to the needs of our patients. And I like that we have data now, Cape Cytobine, Bevacizumab up front in elderly patients. We have data on Fulfirinox, Bevacizumab, we have data on Falfox, Panitumumab, Fulfiris, so we have a lot of data, and then coming out of 8405 and FIRE3, it's probably more, it's probably not as important to what we use really, what specific treatment we use up front, but more the strategy and what we like to do. So I can still say it to this point, my, let's say the garden variety, the normal patient with incurable metastatic colon cancer will probably receive something like Falfox or Falfiri, Bevacizumab in first-line therapy for a certain number of cycles, watching response, and then kind of t toning down the t treatment intensity toward a maintenance therapy. And I routinely use Kipsidin, Bevacizumab. Patients come in every three weeks. They take Kipsidin at home. It's a pretty easy treatment. There are no real cumulative side effects if you titrate the dose of Kipsidin. Um, it's, it's actually, it's, so it's along the lines of induction maintenance. Right. And it leaves options open when patients show tumor progression, relevant tumor progression, re-intensify therapy, you can go to, you can change the chemotherapy backbone, you can change the antibody. So, but as initial, and I, I tell my patients up front, this is my strategy for you. Would I give patients a break from maintenance therapy if they want to go on vacation, if they want to travel the world and do things they always want to do without chemo? Yes, you'd sure. be my guest. So, but... Having a default strategy and adjusting it, I think, is, is, makes sense. But we you would it. probably have different approaches to, to projecting those vacations between the, a patient with a, a BRAF mutant tumor and peritoneal metastases yeah, yeah. versus that's, someone that, with that's asymptomatic why I say, you know, uh, that's I say, you know, if it, you adjust the tools according to the needs of the patient. So there are patients where I would say, you know, this is a Fulfirinox patient. And we might even be adding an egf septic antibody to it if we see all RAS wild type. Um, if you really need a response right away in order to, uh, to you know, control for symptoms, et cetera, uh, in some patients, you might even start with Kipsidin, Bevacizumab, low-volume disease, elderly patients, smoldering. You know, you have a good, pretty good idea. It's not very aggressive. So I like that we have tools. The problem for community oncologists is to adjust these tools according to the patients and be aware of all these tools. Why do we use pumps still? I mean, has anybody actually ever carried a pump for 46 hours, at, uh, you know, two days every two weeks? And what would that do to your work schedule and your life and your dog at home? And are, are, is, is this really, uh, you know, lots of rest of world has said, okay, we're gonna use oroflorpyrimidines. We've got a new one coming um, down the pike. Um, why are we still using pump? Well, I, we don't use capecitabine hardly ever at my institution, and I think it's because the drug is irregularly absorbed and metabolized. We have more toxicity problems on average with patients on capecitabine than we do with infusional 5-FU. We don't know what dose they're taking. Uh, and again, the dose, if we, do we use the dose that's been shown to be most effective in the studies? The answer is often not, because studies are done in Europe mostly. And the dose that's but I bet you drop the bolus of your Folfox regularly. We do indeed. That so modified, modified, fo study. modified Folfox six is was has never been studied compared to others, and uh, is what we use. I personally find that uh, the problem with capecitabine in too frequently in our experience is a toxicity problem that we then lose time, and so we tend not to use a capecitabine. In contrast, 30 miles down the road from my institution from here, <laughs> uh, they, I'm not sure they have, a, they have pumps available <laughs> in their facility. I sort of am on that side of the, the so, camp, I so, have to but confess. But that, uh, that is my preference. Also, capecitabine is extremely labor intense for our nurses. It is. That's true. And, Money, co-pays, all of that. And correct. actually, it's gotten worse off 
label, off patent, because yeah, now the copay assistance Correct. and all that's gone away. Yeah, yeah, so Correct. In some ways, it's uh, more of a challenge. Yeah, but Herb? I think, yeah, Herb? yeah so uh, I completely agree with the sentiment. Mm. And I think there are a number of variations on the theme, which we're never going to have randomized trial comparing every little nuance. Right. Um, I think there have been, you know, there's, I don't know how many, almost uh, a dozen full Fox variants. Mm. Um, so I think within that, um, we have a preference for Cape Cytobine. Um, maybe it's diet, maybe it's we have more nursing care, but you know, a little more labor, or I, you know, don't pay attention to some of the copay <laughs> issues. But I will say, you know, the, the drama for the pharmacist to help figure out what pharmacy to get the drug filled, the education around oral th is a big deal. I think, however, your point around the pump is real because the, the drama around prescribing, that kind of hits us. Mm. There's often a home care nursing agency that cares for the pump and it's like it happens out there. Yeah. My gestalt is that it's dealer's choice, know your tool, and realize you have to organize around using it well, whether it's organizing home care, patient education one way or the other, um, and then adapting. And I think the biggest issue for any of these is, is there a patient or a family where one approach will just work better or one approach just is not going to work and then see how it goes? Okay. John, to, to your point, um, I've moved more toward capecitabine in part because I had perforated diverticulitis mm. and, and had to be on TPN. You for know, three months. You know what a pump is about. So I carried a port and a pump around for three months, had three episodes of, of sepsis. Um, from from the port, that's not a typical thing, but uh, you know I don't say I'm just going to order an MRI. Or I'm just going to do a simple thing yeah. because once you've had those simple things, they're not so simple. Although I would so argue, simple. I would argue for full fox, if we all, if we certainly do not give oxaliplatin through a peripheral vein. Oh yeah, you need a so 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 we need you need you, a, you need you a know, port. If I joke, if God had worked all seven days, we'd all have one. But but he took a day <laughs> off, and so he left that he, he off was at the list. Yeah. You know, we, yeah. so okay, we need uh, to get the, back the to one science. Wrong, there's yeah. one wrong answer, which is Zolota with Irina Tcan. Mm. Um, um, and while you could go track behind the European experience, the, if, you know, the data in the U.S. around the BIC-C study is we know what doses not to use. Mm. We've never completely validated what, what to use. John, John, one point I want to make about the primary tumor, to, to make sure we yep. finish it. There's a paper today coming out in JAM, sur, JAMA Surgery which is from, uh, from uh, George Chang at MD Anderson that looks at primary tumors in place in patients with colorectal cancer when they present with synchronous metastatic disease. And I was called yesterday to talk to a reporter who said that the, his, the title of his, of his article was Patients Living Longer and Getting Less Cancer Surgery. And so there's a potential to miss the point here, which is in George's study, what they've reported on in a cohort study is that Many patients with primaries in place do not ever need their primary resected. They, so you, we don't need to always remove the primary, but the converse is not necessarily the case that we shouldn't remove the primary in some of these patients. So I just want to make sure that, that this message isn't garbled, that for most patients, the primary, you need to pay attention to it, whether you need to resect it or not is, is an issue. But the paper showed that patients will do well in many cases without the resection, and, and I just want to make sure we get that point. And it remains controversial, because if I remember correctly, although it was at a primary endpoint, in Cairo 3, didn't it show that Cairo people four. had reset? Cairo 4. Cairo 4 is a study Cairo that is four. being done right now. But Cairo 3 sh suggested a very strong positive there, benefit. There's a resection. lot of backwards data that says removing it's a but good it's, idea, it's a but right. is that just a better patient? Correct. Is there very biased other? analysis. So, uh, but, so, it's, but it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, this yeah. is kidney cancer but that's, removing that's the primary. Test, that's why they're testing it prospectively. I think it's a really interesting question. and so But we've got to do a little science here. So, Axel, I'm going to give you the lead on this, and Alan, you're going to get the follow-up. Frontline, unresectable metastatic colon, RAS wild type, pan RAS wild type, um, uh, fire three, <laughs> 80405. Okay, so frontline use of EGFR. We got a new frontline indication for panitumumab with full FOX, right? Survival benefit, all of that. So what's the right answer in the right molecular profiled patient, EGFR versus VEGF frontline? So the right answer is we have options. And the 8405 data clearly show, you know, in the RAS wild type tumors, where they use more or less Falfox or Falfiri with bevacizumab or Cetuximab, or I would expand it to Panitumab, really doesn't matter. Now, 
there are subtle differences. And you know, you talk about toxicity profile, you talk about, let's say, the response rate, you know, the, how much response you can actually achieve, perhaps how fast the response comes, you know, if you talk about one dimensional shrinkage. And there seems to be an edge for uh, EGF septic antibodies over bevacizumab, consistently between fire and 845. Actually, I believe fire and 845 are virtually identical mm -hmm. in their outcomes, except yeah. for one arm, which is the bevacizumab arm in fire 3. And Alan, you and I have talked about this many times. So it's very consistent data that we have. So if you really want to, a response, and the patient is threatened by tumor load, for instance, and we're not talking yet about conversion therapy or whatever. We're talking about threatened by tumor load. You need an anatomic response. I could see that a chemotherapy plus egf septic antibody therapy could have an edge. Now, most patients do not, are not in this situation. So then toxicity issues come in play. And the idea of you know, overall strategy, we talk about this continuum of care, et cetera. And then I would strongly favor bevacizumab because it lends itself very much more to this maintenance therapy concept. You can use it uh, beyond progression into second line. So you can delay the onset of EGF septic antibody therapy delay the onset of rash, stigmatizing rash, uh, diarrhea to some degree. So that's what I would consider is, is a decision factor in my patients. So I'm sure on some level, Alan, you were disappointed. I mean, this is the, it was a great study, big study, important trial. But the, the, if we molecularly enrich around one drug, you know, the way my takeaway was it still didn't find a, you know, we didn't find Herceptin, trastuzumab for colon cancer. Yeah, somebody said to me yesterday, he said, are there any positive p-values in 80405, <laughs> and there is one so far. But I think, I, I wouldn't say, remember well, we- Disappointed meaning I was hoping that right. one would win. I was agnostic to one winning or not, but I, we remember when we designed it, we thought the double biologic would be the winning arm. <laughs> but I think the good news is that we moved the bar from 20 to 22 months in 2004 to about 30 months in 2014. That's the good news. The strategy, the this, this, this sort of moving from one, re one regimen to the other seamlessly seems to make a difference. We, we have a lot of work we're doing now where I believe we will get answers. We may identify subsets of patients who should be treated one way or the other, and I'm very hopeful about that. But I, I would say that uh, the, the take home message to me, as we look at the expanded RAS, at, which we presented at ESMO in 80405, all the, the patients with expanded RAS all lived 32 months, regardless of the arm. The problem is that the patients, now 55 or 60 percent of the patients who had a RAS mutation of any sort, did not do well. They did 24, 25 months. And that, that's our need area now. So we've identified a subset of patients who do very well. Now, as we've expanded RAS, we've, ex we've expanded the number of patients who don't do well. With, uh, with the conventional therapy, and, or don't do as well as, as well. we'd like. Yeah. Panitumumab frontline studies, change your practice at all in terms of choice of EGFR therapies, um, justification for frontline use, this kind of thing? Yeah, so I have equi so I think it, you have equipoise, as Axel said, related to chemo flavor, full fox, full fury, or Zelox if you like it, given the discussion. I also think in a wild type patient, extended wild type, uh, EGFR antibody or BEV, among the anti-EGFR antibodies, I think it's dealer's choice related to which antibody you prefer. I think there's some small advantages related to panitumumab, um, the slightly cleaner data, and also this sort of two week schedule, I think are modest advantages. Um, but I think the, in overall, there's largely dealer's choice. And if there's some institutional preference um, or patient preference for toxicity or how you will manage the continuum, I think the good news is now all those little things may matter. If you wanna disregard the nuances, pick one and sort of get good at it and then sort of work around that. Thoughts, yeah. Yeah, I, since Alan is here, can I ask you for further follow-up on the hundred odd patients who went into 80405 with l in, the intent to go to liver resection? Right. If so, if I remember correctly, there was a, m more of those patients tended to have gotten the EGFR. Agent. That's correct, and we we do not have the details yet to really inform why that was. Two thirds, about uh, 60 percent, 65 percent, 60 to 65 percent who went to resection had cetuximab. 
and the others had Bev. What, what it may be it, that we cannot discern from the, as we've looked through the records, there's a tendency, I think, for cetuximab for practical reasons, because there, there, in many of the cases, there are patients, there's a discussion in the chart about, uh, well, we have to stop the Bev for six or eight, for eight weeks to take them to surgery. And I think there was a re hesitancy to do that. That's a guess. The, it turns out that the patients did the same. If they went to resection, they were a bit likelier to go to resection if they got cetuximab, but they did the same okay. uh, at, the, at, the, at the end of the day. And the problem with this data set, of course, is in cetuximab is the new EPIC data, which, which would be contrary to the belief that, that the patients who are resectable should be treated with cetuximab. Tell, tell us new EPIC. So new EPIC was, is a study done by the, at the UK, uh, in the UK, published in Lancet Oncology about six months ago, which looked at patients, it's a complex study, a host of uh, backbone chemotherapies uh, with cetuximab in patients who were either resectable or marginally resectable. And it's a very, it's a gamish. It's hard to figure out. It's kind of real world. It's a real world It is a real world study a... done in the UK at centers generally with expertise in, in liver resection. And that study, it was stopped early for, for negative results, deleterious results of cetuximab impacting overall outcome for patients negatively with resectable liver metastases, even though PFS, even though response rate was greater with cetuximab. It's very hard to explain.